Okay, if only all the delegates spoke as fast as Tony Juniper of Friends of the Earth, we'd be through this conference. But uh, <laughs> I think you're obviously, you've had bitter experience of you know, agencies thrusting mics in your face and not giving you much time. Uh, you may want to comment on that, uh, Martin Hiller, but I, well, I've also got a question from Gopal Gray. Can the UN set up a climate commission to monitor countries that violate the rules? Um, I mean, I think this is a sort of concern. People are sort of wondering, even if we sign on the dotted line here, do we know that people are going to stick to it? Um, big companies, governments, people? I mean, that's what this conference here is about, and that's what uh, the whole Kyoto Protocol is about. It monitors what countries actually emit, it shows what industrialized countries, what reduction uh, obligations they have, it shows how much they actually fulfill these obligations, it has a compliance regime that's a bit loose, but it's, let's say, appearing, that says what will happen to countries that would not fulfill their obligations. So, you know, this, this, the whole measuring of emissions is actually uh, something that, uh, from, from a systematic point of view, is in development and uh, very often exists already. When it comes to CO2 emissions, it's not very difficult. It's a little bit like with your car. When you know how much fuel you use per, let's say, 100 kilometers or so, then you know how much CO2 goes up into the atmosphere. You can calculate that easily. One thing about uh, pollution that I would like to mention in that context is that we need to be a bit careful that we're not diverted from the really big polluters. And when we talk about air pollution and, and, and climate pollution today, we should really look at coal, and we should really look at coal power stations, and look at very dirty coal power stations. Uh, we have published reports, for instance, comparing power stations in, in Europe. Uh, many others are comparing now coal power stations. Coal power stations in themselves are the biggest problem for climate. And they are a massive amount of coal power stations all over the world. We hear very often, as Marcus said earlier, about coal power stations going, going up in China. But we don't hear so often that in Germany there are up to 40 or 50 coal power stations planned for the next 20, 30 years. Planned without any filters or something, uh, nothing. Just normal coal power stations, as if global warming wasn't happening. That's all in the plans of the big German, very rich, energy companies who want to build that stuff. RWE alone wants to build 12 new coal power stations in the next 15 years. Can I, I just want to stop you there because you, you, I'm not sure whether this is contradictory, but you, you were saying before, or several, a couple of you have said that people, this is a big problem. We know what the problem is. The science has been documented. It's about time these governments really got their act together and took decisions, but in a way you're suggesting actually not everyone does get it, that actually it is business as usual, there's a lot of talk, there's stuff in the media, but, but uh, they're not doing it. There is no economic incentive for RWE or whatever the power companies are not to build coal-fired power stations because, well, I mean, there, because there is a price on carbon, but it's too low. And so it's still cheaper for them to emit CO2 into the atmosphere than it is for them to put their money into renewables or yeah, build wind turbines or solar or whatever other low-carbon generating sources there are. So that's why we've got to have a global agreement which applies to everybody and which puts a price on carbon which gradually escalates until we decarbonize our economy, where there's nobody who's exempted from that and there's no free riders and it applies equally to all all companies in particular and eventually all countries. So, I mean, it, it does come back to the point where you need, you need this global framework because otherwise the economic incentives, no company can, can decarbonize out of the goodness of its heart, particularly if it's an energy company, because its shareholders would kick the directors out of power and the next lot of directors would go back to doing what they did before. They've got to maximize their return. That's their job as a company. So we've got to get the economics right by getting the politics right. Okay, they say you should, if you're an actor, never act with a child star. If you're an interviewer, never go on with journalists and... Uh, activists, uh, because now uh, Tony Juniper has now turned all my questions around and my rudimentary order has completely <laughs> gone up the spout. And now I don't know what I've asked you already. But we must get through. There's one of them, there's one of them I do want to ask you, because this person wrote in uh, before, um, Jamie in London, uh, the other night, and we didn't get around to it. So this is a little bit different. I'd still like to discuss, he's waiting, the power that religion might have. Couldn't the world's religious leaders work together to help fight the battle of CO2 emissions? Yes. Yes. One of the best things they could do. Yes. It would probably be one of the best things they could do. But there is some evidence, isn't there, of this already, Tony Juniper? I think the penny is beginning to drop in some places, but I have to say that, that some of the theological takes on environmental issues have been very unhelpful. And in the United States, for example, one of the uh, blocks of the power base of George W. Bush was a, a, a fairly 
um, unhelpful group of right-wing Christian outfits who did believe, and I think some of them still do believe, that if the earth goes up in smoke, it's God's will. There's nothing we should do about it, and indeed bring it on. This is a, this is a good thing. Well, they get to heaven quicker. They get to heaven quicker. This is their view. Some other Christian thinkers think quite the opposite, that with the earth we need to sustain and to nurture. It's God's gift, and therefore we should be um, protecting it the best we can. So there's a range of opinions in, in the religious communities, and I do think it would be good to have much more intensive debates to start unearthing some of these issues and bringing people to see the emergency that we face and the moral uh, imperative now doing something about it. That is changing and I think in the US this is one of the groups I didn't mention that shifted very far very quickly is the evangelical Christian community. They've had theological discussions and they've decided that the earth going up in smoke actually isn't a very accurate reading of the scriptures and what we should do is protect it and that's very good but I think we need a much more public engagement and I think interfaith uh, initiatives with Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Christian thinkers coming together and talking about this issue, I think is still a missing piece. Maybe in Copenhagen or next year at the climate negotiations, maybe some of the green groups, WWF and Friends of the Earth, should try to put together a meeting of world religious leaders. There we are. What a good idea. Thank you for that. So maybe we'll do this in Poland next year. Yes, Poland. Poland next December. Okay. Knildrig Abie says, what's been accomplished so far? on initiatives of deforestation. Oh, with deforestation. Now, this is a tricky issue, and we haven't covered it much. He wants to know what's been accomplished so far on initiatives of deforestation and on an ad adaptation fund for developing nations. Can you just give us, Martin uh, Hiller, uh, a little update on adaptation fund and particularly deforestation? Okay. <laughs> I will try. Um, on the adaptation fund, we have got that fund finally operational. That was a two years battle. Uh, the fund was actually in principle decided two years ago, but the operational side of the fund wasn't decided. There was a big fight between the developing countries uh, who said they don't want to have that under the Global Environment Facility, the GEF, because they said the GEF is too bureaucratic and too slow and too much dominated by the World Bank. And on the other hand, interestingly, a coalition between the US and the European Union who said, yes, we want to have it under the GEF. There was another much more interesting argument where the developing countries said, we're actually entitled to get adaptation money under the UN uh, treaty uh, because we get, we get that money from another mechanism, a carbon market mechanism, the clean development mechanism. And it's not development aid, whereas the GEF is, in the wider sense, development aid. It's something that rich countries give graciously or not so much, uh, but um, it's a voluntary action, whereas the CDM is part of a legal system and that the adaptation fund. Anyway, it has re been resolved here. It's finally operational, and that's important because the, the poorest countries will finally, hopefully, get a little bit of support to deal with the impacts that they feel already from climate change. That's one bit. The deforestation bit, I think, has been solved this morning or yes yesterday evening, actually. Yeah. Is it completely solved now? Is it done now? Okay. I give that to Tony. Because he okay. We'll give it to Tony Juniper. Forestry. Um, not, it's not a piece I've followed very closely. But there is now an agreement that my colleagues who have looked at this, they, they say it's not bad. Uh, one of the things we were concerned about was, was um, there being a new mechanism which might undermine the rights of indigenous people who live in these forests already. Uh, the idea, of course, is to link in uh, deforestation to the climate issue, which is absolutely fair because it's about a fifth of global emissions annually is coming from deforestation, particularly in the tropics. And so there's an attempt here to link in the deforestation issue with the climate change deal. Um, as you could imagine, this is about um, sovereignty issues and countries' um, forests uh, being belonging to themselves still, about money transfer issues, about indigenous people, having a carbon market linkage between forests and uh, the northern countries, so that, for example, you could build a new runway at Heathrow, and then you could say, well, we're going to buy some of the Brazilian rainforest uh, carbon credits, and therefore we can build our airport and still be green. That would be a disastrous, inadvertent signal. It's not there at the moment, and so that's something to um, be pleased about. Yeah.